¿Cómo se siente usted? Es que no sé si soy un pintor más famoso del mundo, porque hay mucha gente que me, me pidan por la calle autógrafos y realmente no saben si soy un cantante, un actor de cine, un loco, un escritor, no, no se sabe bien lo que soy. Absolutamente nada. Nada. Nada, nada. nada. ¿Y a la ¿Por qué? No, no, porque soy, soy. Lo digo siempre, soy muy mal pintor por la razón de que soy demasiado inteligente para ser buen pintor. Para ser buen pintor hay que ser un poco burro. ¿Y a la vida? A, a menos, a menos uh, Velázquez, que es, ese es, es un genio que pasa de mucho al acto pictórico. Y a la vida, pues le debo todo. Porque el día que Dalí hiciera un cuadro bien hecho, como Velázquez, o como Vermeer, o como Rafael, o una música como Mozart, la semana siguiente uno se muere. Y entonces yo prefiero hacer cuadros malos y vivir más tiempo. Esta exhibición es sobre una journey. The journey is the migration of ideas and images that are born in different media within his work. Dali is and remains throughout his entire career an artist. He is a painter. But he is someone who is able to use cinema a bit the way he used writing and also drawing. It's an experimentation. It's a way of seeing how different things look in different media. see a line that goes from Dali to artists who are involved in filmmaking and also this play of the artistic persona. Hello, um, my name is Sarah Cochran. I am Assistant Curator of Modern Art here at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where we opened the Dali Painting and Film Show in October. Um, this is a project um, with which we have been working for about two years with the Tate Gallery in London um, and colleagues in the St. Petersburg Museum in uh, Florida and also uh, with the Museum of Modern Art in New York. The exhibition actually um, is the brainchild of two uh, prominent scholars uh, of Dali's work, which is Felix Fanez, who is the great Spanish expert on Dali, and Don Adis, who is the great British expert on surrealism. In 2004, which was the centennial of Dali's birth, Felix Fanez did a very interesting exhibition called Dali, um, Dali and Mass Culture, in which he realized that there was enough material to really look into um, the relationship, working relationship that Dali had with film and what it actually did to uh, inspire his work. The interesting thing about the exhibition, and obviously one of the reasons we were so anxious to have it here in Los Angeles, 
is obviously to do with the film component. We were anxious to highlight the work that Salvador Dali has done here in Los Angeles. And as the head of the Salvador Dali Foundation in Figueres, Spain said, in bringing the exhibition here to Los Angeles, it was really about bringing Dali home because most people don't know it. But between 1940 and 1948, Dali spent a significant amount of time here in the beautiful state of California. So the exhibition is really about um, a journey. It is premised on the idea that Dali's relationship to modernism is very closely linked to his relationship to film. And that relationship to film changes over time as Dali goes from being someone who is a fan of cinema to being someone who works as a critic of cinema, as a student actually in his student days, to someone who works with his film Luis Buñuel making films to working within the Hollywood studio system and then later collaborations with other uh, filmmakers to make films that purely satisfy his own ideas and thoughts. Um, and the other thing I would just add to that is the exhibition is also about this dialogue, which is the dialogue of how images and certain ideas migrate from the paintings, mostly from the paintings and his writings and drawings into film. But there are some examples where uh, certain entities come out of the film and go into paintings, the most notable of which are the ants. I mean, we think of ants as almost a second signature of Delhi, and that is really something we see for the first time in 1929 in his film, uh, Un Chien de Loup. So here we're standing in front of a painting from 1930 called The Bleeding Roses. Um, the painting in itself is obviously a very beautiful painting. Um, also quite a disturbing, I think, spatially uh, painting. Um, it, it shows off Dali's tremendous skill in describing, and obviously this is one of the first things that people talked about. The first criticism of Dali's work was that he is this marvelous technical painter, but he uses that great technical sp the skill to actually um, create nightmares. So it's, it's always very interesting how you have this sort of dichotomy in his work of the sort of careful craftsman and the mad genius, which comes out very, very early. And that will be, we'll see that when, when he comes to work in Hollywood. I mean, that's also the way Hollywood deals with him. Um, one of the things that I'm most interested in this painting really has to do with the architecture. I, I think there's a sense of almost a vertigo that you, you, you get when you look at it. And interestingly, this is not something Dali could have experienced himself in Europe because at the time, the, city he, the cities he knew, which were Barcelona, Madrid, and Paris, they did not have a critical mass of skyscrapers. So I really believe the only way Dali could have come to terms with this would have been watching the films of Harold Lloyd, because the, the skyscrapers were really in Chicago and they were in New York. So this is a very interesting example of how film has come to um, influence in an oblique fashion his painting. And before I think the exhibition opened, we did have a lot of people saying, but Dali never made a film. And that is true. Dali always collaborated on films, but that is not to say that Dali didn't think a great deal about it. And in his drawings in the 30s, we start to see different elements sort of creeping in, um, especially to do with a way of using storyboard construction in his drawings to actually create a mini narrative. Um, so, so here I do think that although Dali is perhaps per se not a filmmaker, he comes to think in filmic uh, ways, especially to do with lighting, especially to do al also with other ideas of um, how the camera lens can actually be used. His first interest in film, one of the first things he wrote critically about was the idea of the close-up. He was fascinated by this idea that basically focusing the camera lens in or focusing it out, one totally changed uh, what the object was and how we perceive the object. And I think this was his first great influence um, and excitement about film. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, you have to understand that Dali is really the first generation of artists who actually can use cinema. Um, artists like Braque and Picasso, they were very excited about cinema and they did reference it also. But they were of a generation who couldn't actually think about taking up a camera. But Dali's generation with Bunuel, with, with uh, Man Ray, with, with many other visual artists, they were actually of this generation and they realized that this was the wave of the future and they embraced it very, very readily. Here we're standing in front of a, a very beautiful um, charcoal and gouache, uh, which is one of the elements that um, Dali created for his uh, project with the Marx Brothers. Um, in 1960, sorry, 1936, 
Dali met uh, Harpo Marx in Paris and that Christmas he sent him a harp that was strung with barbed wire and Harpo Marx was obviously delighted because he responded with a photograph where all his fingers are bandaged. Um, he also sent a, um, a telegram in which he said, uh, Harpo Marx said that he was a great fan of uh, Salvador Dali and that if Salvador Dali ever came to Hollywood he would like to be smeared by him. Dali came to Hollywood for the first time in 1937 um, and then what happened was he decided to work on a project, a film project for the Marx Brothers. The story would be um, about a Spanish aristocrat called Jimmy who was fiancéed to the boring uh, and slightly snobbish Linda who falls in love with um, the personification of wonder and cruelty who is a surrealist woman and her best friends with the Marx Brothers. And there were lots and lots of different sort of gags that, that um, were involved. Against type, um, Harpo Marx would have been the star. And um, the other interesting thing about the project is that it's really something Dali took to heart. He worked on it for about 20 years, but unfortunately it never really came to flourishing. There's a number of interesting things about the this project, which actually reflect, as I was saying, some of the larger issues in the uh, exhibition, one of which is about the way um, different elements sort of come in and out of his work. The film would actually have uh, involved two elements that Dali created for the British, ex um, British supporter of surrealism, whose name was um, Edward James. Edward James had um, commissioned a sofa in the shape of Mae West lips and had also commissioned the uh, lobster telephone. The lobster telephone was supposed to be a working telephone for Edward James's private residence, which was Monkton House in uh, the south of England. Um, but yet it was called for in the script. And there is another lovely detail in the script where Groucho is represented in the Shiva of big business with multiple arms answering multiple phones. In 1944, Salvador Dali signed a contract with Vanguard Films to work on the Alfred Hitchcock film Spellbound. Um, Spellbound is a very interesting film because it is the first film to take on seriously psychoanalysis. And it does this from the start. It opens up with a segment where it says, Psychoanalysis is the way we treat the diseases of the mind of the sane. A man was walking around with a large pair of scissors cutting all the drapes in half. I requested uh, Dali. Selznick, the producer, had the impression that I wanted Dali for the publicity value. Yeah. That wasn't it at all. What I was after was, again, the thing we talked about earlier, the vividness of dreams. As you know, all Dali's work is very solid and very sharp, with very long perspectives and, and black shadows. Uh, actually, I wanted the dream sequences to be shot on the back lot, not in the studio at all. Mm. I wanted them shot in the bright sunshine so the cameraman would be forced to what we call stop down and get a very hard image. This was, again, the avoidance of the cliché. All dreams in movies are blurred. It isn't true. Dali was the best man for me to do the dreams because that's what dreams should be. So that was the reason I had Dali. I think it's really indicative of, of how quickly surrealism um, managed to infiltrate uh, Hollywood and how important it would become for Hollywood. And it's a two-way street because in 1937, when uh, Dali had first come to Hollywood, he had really realized this was a way to get the ideas um, of surrealism out to a mass audience. And he was very excited about doing this. And this project was certainly instrumental to him realizing just what were the sort of possibilities and limitations of Hollywood. Here we have uh, a drawing from the Tate Gallery's collection, The Metamorphosis of Narcissus from 1937. And again, for us as we looked at the paintings, we were looking at paintings that sort of described something about film, um, which usually had to do with perhaps an idea of emptiness as though his paintings were sort of a backdrop for, for you to sort of project your own um, anxieties or perhaps ideas onto. Certain films that reversed traditional techniques of painting 
um, and use perhaps more filmic uh, uh, lighting or certainly something like this that seemed to us to talk about certain ideas in film. Um, as the name of the painting sort of points to, this is supposed to be an illustration of the myth of Narcissus, who was of course the very beautiful shepherd in Greek mythology, who one day caught his reflection in a pool of water and discovered that he was so beautiful that he attempted to embrace it, fell in and drowned. And the gods were so bereft at this loss of this exquisite creature that they named the Narcissus flower after him. Um, Narcissus is obviously a very interesting uh, image because it's also obviously something that was taken up in Freudian analysis as the idea of a sort of self-love that is too important. And in this it should be said that although, especially in Dali's early works, he deals a lot with his phobias and fears, it's always difficult to know the part of sincerity in Dali's work because he, he was such an astute and well-read reader of Freud that although he was dealing with fears, real fears at times, he also knew how the tools that were going to be used to sort of analyze this work. So there is a, certainly a whole psychological aspect to this. For us, sort of on a more formal level, what we were interested in is this image of the shepherd boy here with his head on his knee um, coming and, and echoing in this hand holding the egg out of which the narcissus is sprouting. For us, we really felt this, this spoke to an understanding of the techniques of dis dissolve and fade, the way you can actually sort of take the camera's focus out of an object and then focus it in on something else. And so we were interested in this kind of um, very artistic translation of that very specific film uh, technique. And then obviously we would be fools not to use these really beautiful uh, images. I mean, Dali is and obviously remains, you know, a formidable and talented painter and really one that is so much uh, part of the popular imagination. Um, it was great fun to work with works of this caliber, that's uh, certainly one thing I can say. Um, in 1951, uh, Dali was commissioned by Jack Warner to do a portrait of himself and also his wife Anne. Unfortunately, Anne is in Japan and could not make it for the exhibition. But in the painting, there's a really lovely bit. You have the Légion d'honneur, which is red. You have the Carnation, that's red. And then you would have had Anne on that side, who, would, who is dressed in red. So that would be a nice formal way of bringing the two portraits together. Um, this is probably the piece we've been most criticized for including. Critics have said that this is really about the late, sort of um, very commercial portraiture that Dali did. And while there is a lot of the late portraiture, which is usually very fashionable, usually makes the women look very beautiful and then has a very fashionable surrealist element to it. I think this is an altogether different kind of painting. Um, spatially it is a very, very odd painting. As we've seen, Dali is really an excellent technical painter, but this kind of plinth thing seems to disappear between, behind the dog and Jack Warner when you get to here. The dog is obviously a little out of proportion towards Jack Warner. And also the flatness of this hand is also very, very strange. Um, I like to look at this painting, and one of the reasons I'm so happy we have it is that I think this speaks to Dali's ultimate understanding of Hollywood, which is that Hollywood was about making people two-dimensional. And that actually goes beyond just putting them onto film and therefore making them two-dimensional. It's also about the way the studio system protected its uh, stars and also all of the people involved, involved in the studios. They were very much two-dimensional characters. Their foibles, their scandals, those very seldom got out. They were really rather seamless PR sort of entities. Um, and I think that this really speaks to it in that way, the way that um, there's something inherently artificial about Dali. Even, I think, in the landscape, you know, you, over here you have a very sort of Dutch landscape with those beautiful blue hills, really, you know, something the Dutch created. And then this very Italianate landscape here. It's a very pompous landscape. It's not at all surrealist. The other thing I think is very interesting is the way that Jack Warner's clothes, a lot of the colours of Jack Warner's clothes, really come out and sort of are, are, are mimicked in this landscape. And I think it's a way of sort of speaking um, of the power of Jack Warner, one of the Warner Brothers, obviously, the way he really could create fantasy and create a world that we would believe in. And here he is sort of expanding out his own background. And I think this alludes to something that for me is probably the most interesting part of, of the exhibition, 
which actually has to do with Dali and his persona. Dali is someone, probably the first artist, who really created an artistic persona and performed it. Um, in this way, he, the distance between who he was and who he was perceived at was always very ambiguous. And I really don't think that Dali could have come up with this without realizing how Hollywood and the sort of studio system was actually conceiving and inventing and presenting its stars. And for me, this is really the arc that brings material in this exhibition out of its historical context and really projects it into the current day. We know that Andy Warhol, who was very close friends with Dali in the 1960s, watched Dali, thought about how, da how Dali had become a major artist. And that link from Dali then to Warhol, which is again about this performance of an artistic persona, then comes out and comes up to artists like Murakami, Jeff Koons and Matthew Barney. So really I think this is perhaps the most interesting part of the exhibition and perhaps also the most oblique and most difficult to understand. But I hope that the viewers will go away with some inkling of that. Salvador Dali spent about a whole year at my place in Virginia. I had a lovely deer park that went with Hampton Manor, also a pond down at the end of the garden that was overgrown, and uh, he decided that it would be a very good idea to make a real production of this. So we hauled a piano up into the tree, and we put uh, uh, figures floating on the pond also. Days were very extraordinary. Dali's main income now came from the society portraits for which he was able to find numerous commissions. The portraits depict the elite of American society in an ironic style which parodies the great portraits of the Italian Renaissance. At the same time, the famous couple were busy promoting surrealism as a craze with which to conquer America. Dali's showmanship inevitably attracted him to the West Coast dream machine, and not surprisingly, he found Hollywood a particularly fertile ground for his imagination. Salvatore Dali was an internationally famous artist, and he, was, uh, he lived here in Monterey uh, for four or five years, I guess, so they got him to to uh, back this, this party, which was uh, called A Night in the Enchanted Forest. And I had been doing the parties for old Sam Morse at Del Monte, so they had me work with uh, Dolly, in, which I found very amusing. Dolly's concept was to change this huge ballroom into a, a forest glen. And to do it, he got uh, hundreds of uh, gunny sacks and filled them full of paper and started from this, the floor at one end uh, and went up to the ceiling at the other. So when it was all up, it looked like a rock grotto. And then they had blue lights turned on it to give a night effect. He had uh, managed to get, uh, oh, about a hundred mannequins from one of the stores, so all women's nude mannequins and he had different heads which he brought up from Hollywood of uh, different animals alligators foxes and everything on on the on the nude figures and down the middle of the of the of the grotto he had a huge bed which was the table and down the middle of the, of the bed there were uh, cages of wild animals porcupines and so on. And Dolly and his wife in their pajamas were under the tablecloth. <laughs> Mr. 
Salvador Dali gives a party. The Spanish painter of surrealism dresses Mrs. Dali in a unicorn's head, just to start things off. As hostess, she presides from a red velvet bed. The party is a benefit for refugee artists, and costumes are supposed to represent the guests' bad dreams. Artist Dolly wears ear flaps, representing anatomy. A puzzled guest, Bob Hope, sees the fish course served in satin slippers. Presumably, the fish is soul. Soldier Jackie Coogan and the still baffled Mr. Hope see the main course. The party is surrealism, but them frogs is real. Definitivamente está en la hibernación uh, de los moluscos. Pero entonces usted cree en Dios. Creo en Dios, pero no tengo la fe. Ah. Por las matemáticas y por las ciencias particulares, sé que es indiscutible que Dios tiene que existir. Pero no me lo creo. Y eso es terrible. Cada vez me acerco más, pero no me lo creo. ¿Te gustaría creérselo? No, pues, entonces todo estaría resuelto. Sobre todo el problema de la muerte, porque yo tiemblo de pensar en la muerte.